What's up, Hawkeye fans? Welcome back. We got a big win over Purdue. We're going to be recapping that game. We've got a special crossover episode with Kate Martin from the women's basketball team, and we are previewing our game at Wisconsin. This is Talking Hawks presented by Hills Bank. No matter where you are in life, Hills Bank is here to help you succeed. Whether you're buying your first house, saving for your child's future, or preparing for retirement, you can count on the people at Hills Bank for the support you need to reach your goals. It's easy to connect with a banker in person, over the phone, or on hillsbank.com, because we believe banking is better through human connection. Hills Bank is an equal housing lender and FDIC member. Hello, Matt. How are you? It's a good, 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 uh, good win. It's a good, it was a good win, kind of. It was an interesting win, wasn't it? It's an uh, Iowa football win. Defense, <laughs> special teams, and uh, enough points to win. And enough points to win. Yesterday was football weather. That's what it felt mm. like to me. I showed up. So last week it was like hot, right? Like 90 degrees. And you wore? And I wore pants. Because... You know what's funny is you end every episode talking about the weather. I know. I'm going to start it talking about the weather. <laughs> um, and then, and I was like so hot. But I was like, this is what I'm wearing. Stay the course because when I pick something out that I'm going to wear, I say, this is what I'm wearing. I'm not going to like, we're not changing it. <laughs> what? No, I do. I, you just don't know. I just have it. I have it in my head. It's all up here. And then this week. A bold statement. I saw there was going to be 60 and I was like, 60 and sunny. That's not bad. Showed up in a skirt and a sweater. And I was like, what am I doing? You would think at some point I've been on this earth for 29 years. I've lived in Iowa for 29 years. At some point, I have to understand what 60 degrees is and also what 90 degrees is. Like, what kind of clothes do you wear for that climate? Oh, you probably wear this. No, I can't figure it out. And I show up to every game like, shouldn't have worn that. Oh, shouldn't have worn this. Too hot and too cold. But it's always happened to me. Uh. Yeah, you don't care. Nobody else cares either except for me and maybe my sister. She definitely cares. <laughs> okay. Um, but we had an awesome honorary captain yesterday, Robert Smith. He Talk played to back, me about him. He played back in the 80s, played for Hayden Fry. And on our on-field interview, he was like, my question to him, he just did one question and then like just addressed the fans kind of thing. And my question was like, how much has Kinnick Stadium changed since you've been here? And he's like, honestly, it hasn't changed that much. Um, he's like, but I remember talking to Hayden Fry before I came here because he was his first recruit. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's a very cool thing. Coming from Texas. And then he stayed in Iowa because he loved it so much. Um, But he was saying that Hayden Fry told him, these are the best fans in college football. This is the best um, atmosphere that you will get. And these are just the best people in Iowa in general. And so he said that like to all the fans and they were so excited. Everyone got pretty pumped because everyone, I mean, the fans love when they get addressed and appreciated and all of that. So it was really cool. And then I can't remember how he ended it when I said like, is there anything else you want to say? But yeah, something, 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 go Hawks. <laughs> and everyone loved that. So he's actually a referee in the Big Ten. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so I asked him, I was like, what do you know about Purdue? And he was like, oh, um, I actually refereed their game versus Illinois last week. So he had a lot of information on that too. So it was cool. He was a very cool honorary captain. Uh, yeah, it sounds cool. First recruit for uh, the next 40 years of what would be two head coaches. Isn't that unreal? That's that's a wild thing to think about. Yeah. Talk about stability and Versus some of these other schools, you know, like we're actually going to play Wisconsin. They've been through quite a few coaches, Mm -hmm. uh, even since I was getting recruited. Yeah. Same with uh, Nebraska, who will play at the end of the year. Like it's it's definitely, I want to say a roulette table. uh, Some some places you just never know what you're going to get. But uh, consistency at Iowa seems to be the mantra and they continue to live by that. Yeah. Let's talk about the game yesterday. Let's do it. Well, I guess today will be Monday when it comes out. Let's talk about the game on Saturday. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what do you got? Deacon Hill's first official start at Kinnick Stadium. He seemed a little hot. He was like, he was he was ready to go. Well, the second play of the game, I'm pretty sure he just like flicked his wrist and it went about 75 yards down the field. <laughs> it's so, giving it's uh, giving Big Ben. I'm just saying. You know, I, it's <laughs> not that I didn't expect him to be able to throw it that far, but it looked pretty effortless. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely a tale of two games, right? So... Going into his potential mindset, again, I'm not Deacon Hill, but going into his potential mindset of last week, I'm the backup, I'm the backup, I'm the backup. Maybe I'll play, but like, I'm the backup, right? Cade's the guy. Cade goes down early. He doesn't really have time to think. You're just thrown into it and you go back to what it is that you normally do. And I talked about his ball placement was really good last week. And I don't think anybody could really debate me on that. His ball ball placement was great last week. 
this week, full week, knowing that he's the guy, first time in that particular scenario in terms of mentally, how do you how do you handle that? And uh, he came out a little bit high on some throws, uh, found his number one target, Eric All, which should probably continue to be our number one target. Um, but, you know, there were guys that were open downfield. We just missed them, you know, and oftentimes when you have a quarterback that's a little bit amped up or, um, you know, adrenaline's falling a little bit too much, they tend to throw it either too hot uh, in terms of fast or too high to where nobody can catch it, which I'd rather have that than be too low where DB has an opportunity to make a play. Usually if you're high, your guy, pl- your guy makes a play or nobody makes the play, which was the case um, last week, except for the one interception that went off of Seth Anderson's uh, face mask uh, and then got picked off some about number six on that sideline Amir had the same thing happen to him against Minnesota but um, I think that now that he's had that under his belt hopefully we can move forward from this he knows that that wasn't his best performance right and so now he has an opportunity to again take the full week understand what he's doing and then move on but uh, six of 21 obviously isn't a great stat line but being able to find Eric all for a touchdown on third and one it was a great play call um, everybody thinks we're going to run it. And we were actually in 14 personnel. Laura. No, I'm not doing it. 14 no, personnel, <laughs> one back, four tight ends. So yeah. that means no receivers on the field. Eric all was actually in the backfield as a fullback um, because he's, he's been blocking well all game long and uh, just runs a little flat route and linebacker thought he could keep up with him. Eric all is too fast. Great ball by Deacon. So he's definitely got it in him. Like I'm not concerned about uh, a couple high throws, you know, uh, you could argue it's more than a couple, but either way, you know, being able to settle in, we've seen what he's capable of when he played Michigan State. It's just re um, remaking that kind of stuff uh, as opposed to having the adrenaline too high or whatever. And we're going to get into this, obviously, in our preview of Wisconsin, but a transfer from Wisconsin. So I'll be very curious what that's like for him when he gets back into that atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Like I said, we will get to that point. But let's talk about the run game. Caleb Johnson, welcome back. Yeah, uh, second play of the game to have that kind of hole. Uh, Jason Garrett, uh, who was the uh, he was a commentator on Peacock, which never thought I'd have to subscribe to that also not your favorite i learned when i got home oh no it was terrible it was so many pixels it was like it was like uh if you were trying to video something on our motorola razor and then you're trying to watch that dang it peacock well it's just like (laughs) if you're gonna make a major deal like that you gotta you gotta gotta understand like who the fans are like i understand they're trying to make money you know big time's gonna do there but i had a really rough experience hopefully others didn't um how do you feel about that name it could be better. Well, I mean, I think it's based off of NBC or well, obvious. Yeah, it's NBC's yeah. logo. I get it, yeah. but it's just like oh, download Peacock. Not a good choice. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> uh, trying to watch it off the Motorola Razor, it was. Um, it just sounds like something that you shouldn't be typing in. Right. 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 Yeah, I agree. Read between the lines. Uh, anyway, so. <laughs> Caleb Johnson. I'm free. Okay, thank you. I'll bring it back. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, Jason Garrett was talking about how anybody could run through that hole because he did a great job, and that actually is where Unsung Hero later is going to come from. Um, but he was basically untouched the entire way for 60-plus yards, so that's a pretty good way to start. You know, I think there's always a lot of talk on our offensive line. You know, the run game hasn't been as good lately. Uh, so to open up something like that, I think LaShawn Williams, I think anybody could have won uh, could have had that particular play. So it feels good just to have that uh, and to see the speed come back after missing so many games for Caleb Johnson. So that was there. Uh, throughout the run game, we had a couple a couple plays that were really good. Um, I'm surprised that we haven't seen the quarterback sneak as often. When he ran it, we ran it once last week with Michigan State, um, just with a 270, 260 pound quarterback. I mean, that could be a first and 10 play call for five yards. <laughs> I think <laughs> Iowa fans would get behind that. Mm-hmm. But uh, so that's the only thing I think I'm, quote, missing from our run game. But for the most part, I thought we did relatively well. And this really felt like the Eric all game in a way. For sure. Anything else you want to say about him and his performance? It was exciting. So It was fun to see him, like, obviously a friend of the podcast. But it is just fun to see him kind of, like, show what he's capable of in terms of pass catching. Well, it's that and it's the amount of seal blocks he had. So seal blocks means that he's on the right side of the play and essentially the backside. So I'm going to try and set this up here. So you got five linemen and from left to right, you've got tackle guard, center guard, tackle. Okay. And on the far right, in this instance, we're going to put Eric all as a tight end. Usually he's in a wing position, so it makes it a little bit easier for him to seal block. So what happens is all five linemen, tackle guard, center guard, tackle, all slant, which means that their first step is going to the right because they're trying to cut off the D lineman there. 
Well, the problem is when you do that, there's normally a D lineman outside the backside tackle, and he's just going to stay in what they call the hip of the tackle. So that way he can run down the play. Like we're all going to the right. He's going to run it down from the backside. So oftentimes we have a seal block where Eric Gall has to come back and hit somebody that's much bigger than him to keep him from the play. And he did that play after a play after a play. And that guy was never making the play. So like that kind of physicality, he talked about how he loves being physical, but then five catches from 97 yards and a touchdown. We knew they had a connection last week against Michigan state. And now to continue that he had five of the six completions, um, some of them on like quick slants and obviously the deep touchdown. Like, I think there's something to be said for another NFL tight end coming through university of Iowa. And that's a pretty cool thing. Very cool. Tight end. You, you cannot, you can't, you can't argue you, you it. You can't. It is what it is. Yes. Just accept it. End of the half for the offense. Tell me about that. Let's talk about it. So, well, first of all, it was this stupid, I don't know how Purdue got the second kick and how they fooled literally the entire referees. Um, our producer, John was watching the game. I don't mm -hmm. know if uh, he caught this. But they said that off the kickoff, um, sorry, James, we appreciate you too. I didn't mean to leave you out. And he's giggling back there. Thanks, James. Um, so on the kickoff, the kicker stated that the ball was starting to move because of the wind. It wasn't that windy. I was there. And so that's why the kick was bad. And they let him re-kick it. No, nah, he just kicked it terribly. He fooled everybody. They showed the replay, like not quite frame by frame, although that's what Peacock TV typically is. <laughs> And they were able to like show that it didn't move at all. And so he got to re-kick it again, equally as bad. <laughs> like, I mean, which they were trying to squib kick it so that we didn't get a big return, right? Mm -hmm. So they did that. But then with 30 seconds left in the half, we tried to go down and get points. Like normally, and what I mean by normally is like, uh, when I was there, we probably would have just run a few plays, gone into half, called it. But like they were trying to give Deacon Hill opportunities to go down and push it. And I think on third down, we finally got Eric all for about 11 yards or something like that. Uh, but then by then it was too late, right? We only had 30 seconds to go. But knowing that you've got a Drew Stevens in your pocket that can kick a 50 plus yarder. I know we had our own issues on kicking, but like knowing that you've got that kind of weapon makes it so that way you can push it towards the end of the half and just see like, OK, we only need 20 yards to give our guy a chance, let's go out and do that. And that's normally not something that you see an Iowa team do. So I was really happy to see that, like, we're trying to push it towards the end of the half. So let's um let's quick recap defense special teams. We'll just kind of lump them together. Jay Higgins had another great game and a pick. Yeah, dude is making us laugh off the field. And then when he's on the field, he's all business. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about Tony Perkins, like made him break character. Yeah. When he's in <laughs> character on the field, He's scary. But he's like, break the rock, fight for Iowa. <laughs> like, he's in it. <laughs> he, but he's got it, you yeah. know? And, like, another 12 tackles. I think he said when he was in high school, he was, like, top three in the nation in terms of tackles. Like, dude is a tackling machine. Um, so, like, that was really cool to see. Finally getting pressure on the quarterback. KF made a comment that they were last in the FBS, that somebody said that we were – and by FBS, it's, like, the football bowl series or something mm -hmm. when, when we used to have, like, BCS type stuff. Um I think that's what that is. And anyway, so like we only had three sacks coming into the game. And I think we had four or five in the game, maybe even six. Like we were really getting after the quarterback. And so that's nice to see, especially with just our front four, like we typically do. Uh, we don't blitz a ton. So the fact that we were able to do that was really big. Can I say it was so interesting to watch the Purdue quarterback when he was getting um, sacked, the amount of times that he was just like, ah, I'll just throw the ball. And just he like literally threw it backwards <clears throat> over his head at one point. I was like, I don't. I think you should just go down. Like. Well, that one was at the end of the game, fourth down. He's just trying to make a play. It was wild. That one I understand. But yeah, the other ones, he was just flipping it up and they called uh, they called him down because it was unreviewable or something. And so he's a he's a transfer from Texas. I mean, the guy can play, but... Oh, yeah. I was just um, saying, it just looked funny where he was just like, I just, I'm just going to throw this here. Definitely uh, <laughs> not the Iowa way, I would no. say. Uh, and then Cooper, that. pick six. Oh, no, not pick six. Almost a pick six. Almost a pick I six. I wanted to say pick six so badly, but he was like down at the three. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's nice to see him get get there again. They try to challenge him a little bit. Uh, I'll tell you what, that Burks kid is fast, but mm -hmm. uh, Cooper was able to stay with him, at least for most of it. They tried to challenge him on the fourth down. Um, there were a couple deep balls there that they were trying to get him. But um, yeah, I think our defense, as always, played relatively stout. There were a couple plays there that obviously, you know, you'd like to have back. But for the most part, getting after the quarterback, forcing turnovers, that's what Iowa defense needs to do. I also noticed that KF was not happy while we were on defense. He wanted some holding calls. <laughs> like he was like, he was calling the whole, like running down the sideline doing that. I know. Hey, KF works out like that. He does. He, 
He, he gets his 55s in. He gets his other <laughs> stuff. I, and he, I think he normally does it before Sunday or on Sunday before we all come in. Like he, you can tell he's been working out. Yeah. KF, get after it. Okay. Special teams. Cooper had that great return. Um, blocked field goal and a missed field goal. That we yeah. Had. Like I said, not our best game kicking the ball in terms of that. Uh, but Tory Taylor still booming punts. One of them, you could argue, he quote out kicked the coverage, mm. which basically just means that the ball doesn't have enough hang time mm. um, for how far it is. Or that means that you married up. I've heard people say that. You out I've heard you. S- yeah. <laughs> people yeah. say that about me. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, <laughs> anyway, so like that kind of thing happened, I think, once. But outside of that, our special teams are always pretty buttoned up. Um, felt good about where we are in terms of punt return because there are there are things now Cooper is pretty confident in his capabilities once he gets the ball right and we call it hidden yards so like if the ball bounces and you just let it go I mean that ball could have stopped at like the one or the two um I'm thinking of one in particular where it bounced like the eight or maybe the 10 and then it was rolling to him and so he was like I'm just gonna pick it up and go rather than taking the chance and so that's seven or eight hidden yards that he was able to turn into positive yards Mm -hmm. Um, and so having a guy that's willing to take that kind of risks helps uh, with certain things. Now, their opponent was booting him out of the back of the end zone sometimes, too. But um, the hidden yard there, I thought were good for for Cooper to take advantage of. OK, last thing I want to say was how weird was that delay of game with that field goal? Yeah, I don't normally the clock will reset on the refs ready out of a timeout. So I don't know if literally everybody missed the refs ready or what it was. So Yeah, like being there, it was like we were all just kind of like waiting for the play to start and like. Tori was kind of just like looking around like, eh, yeah, we're just sitting here waiting. And like nobody was ready. Like it was just kind of like, yeah, we're just waiting for ref- the ref's call. And then all of a sudden they're like, ah, oh, delay a game. And KF again, like running down the side, like, what are you talking about? Like nobody knew that it was even time to go. And like, I'm not kidding. I wasn't even, I was like, yeah, we're, we haven't started yet. And then all of a sudden they got, it was so confusing. I don't know what went on, but it was, that was an interesting mm-hmm. little thing. I agree with that. Okay, unsung hero as we wrap this little... Well, hold thing. on. One thing before we get to that. You've got a special picture. <gasps> I have a special picture. Yes. Okay, so we're going to put this up on the screen. And if you are just listening, um, I got a picture with Purdue Pete, which is like... She sounds more excited than she actually <laughs> no. cared I, to be. <laughs> no, he was over on our on like the south end where I'm always standing. And he came over and like tapped me on my shoulder. You know, just little mascot antics. And um, I was like, oh, my gosh, the most terrifying mascot in all the Big Ten. I have to get a picture. (laughs) And it is it's just as creepy as you would imagine it to be. It's not a good photo of me. It's a pretty like unflattering picture, but we're going to put it up anyway because it's worth it. And yeah. And he like I said, just as scary as you would imagine it to be. And it's so unsettling that it's just like a guy and you can see the guy's like calves. Like obviously it's a guy in the thing, but usually it's like a full costume. So you can't see any part of the human but they let his like human calves stick out of the football pants. And it's just very like, I don't know. He, he looks top heavy. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. I don't, you'll have to look at the picture. It's pretty funny. Um, but Unsung Hero, let's get to it. Brought to you by JB Roofing. What do we got? Uh, we're going to go with Seth Anderson. Now, I know you're thinking, oh, it's a receiver. Of course. Yes. Yes. I'm doing that. So <laughs> uh, on Caleb Johnson's touchdown, uh, Seth Anderson does his job by what we call taking two. So essentially, the way that Purdue likes to play is they like to have a really deep safety at like 20. Sometimes he'll be off the screen if you're watching tape. But really, you know, between 10 and 20 yards, he's off the ball, single safety, and then they'll play man across the board. And so they're playing man-to-man coverage. Um, And so Seth Anderson has two things he can do. He can either just run his guy off, but the ball is coming his way because he's on the left side. Caleb Johnson's running to the left side. He can either run his guy off and then turn and hope that he blocks him whenever Caleb Johnson gets there and then, you know, allows him to score. Or he can do what we call taking two, where if he does a release at the line, makes the DB think that it's a pass play and then runs to the safety, he'll take his guy completely out of the play and then hope that Caleb Johnson outruns everybody else. So um, on this particular one, on the snap, boom, he hits a release. He gets inside release. He goes to the safety that's 10 or 15 yards downfield. The DB has no idea it's not a run or not a pass play. And by the time that the DB realizes it's a run play, Caleb Johnson is already through because Seth Anderson, all he did literally was do his job by running to the safety instead of just taking the easy way out and just, you know, running a go or whatever. Instead, he tried to take two. I don't even know if he touches anybody on the play. I'd have to go back and, and watch. But all he did was take the right angle to get the guy out of the play. Kayla Johnson scores a touchdown just by doing his job. So Seth Anderson, 
Unsung Hero by J.B. Rufin. Very good. All right. We are getting into a very special conversation for our interview this week. We have a crossover episode with Kate Martin from the women's basketball team. Runners up in the national championship game last season. So excited to see what they do this season. You guys are going to love this conversation. Kate is one, hilarious, and two, has a very interesting family tree. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Need a new roof, gutter, or siding in eastern Iowa? Call JB Roofing, a local and reliable roofer with over 20 years of experience. They do one roof at a time, unlike others who juggle multiple projects and cut corners. They also serve a 45 mile radius around Kelowna and help you with any insurance claims. Don't wait. Call 319 656 Roof or visit their website, jbroofingkelowna.com, for a free estimate. JB Roofing, the small town roofer you can trust. Hey, Matt, did you know that Iowa City Tire does more than just tires? Uh, yeah. I mean, they've been servicing the corridor for like 40 years. Okay, but did you know that until somebody had to tell you? No. No, I didn't. Well, hey, check out how they're doing things in a very different way at Iowa City Tire and Service, where service actually comes first. Visit ictire.com. Hey, welcome back. We are going to get into our interview. A very special guest is joining us today. But first, I want to invite all of you to like and subscribe on YouTube if that's where you are watching and listening. Also, leave some comments. We love to see constructive criticism sometimes. And we also love to see just all your great comments on how much you love the podcast and love the Hawkeyes, of course. Um, and then also on social media, we want you guys to follow us, Talkin' Hawks Pod on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Share it with all of your friends, your family, the Hawkeye fans in your life. We want to spread this to as many as we possibly can. So thank you guys so much for your support as always and do as much as you can on social media. We love that. Okay. We have, like I said, a very special guest joining us today on the podcast. It is a crossover episode. You're used to us talking about Hawkeye football, but today we're bringing in some basketball from the women's basketball team. It is Kate Martin. Kate, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Yes, this is so much fun. We have a huge event coming up in Kinnick Stadium. We will get to that in just a little bit. But just let's just start. Where are you from? Tell us a little about you, your family. Your mother is lovely. I <laughs> met her multiple times, and <laughs> she's you. just the sweetest woman. <laughs> but yes, tell us about you. Yeah, I'm from Edwardsville, Illinois, so southern, close to St. Louis. Um, went to Edwardsville High School. Is it big? Is it small? Big. Like, How many did you graduate with? I graduated with, oh, shoot, like, 600 in my class 500 <laughs> yeah so big <laughs> wow. big school um epinesas went went to high school with them okay, so okay from the same town dad my dad was their football coach everything like that so, so that's why they got to where they are right exactly and epi so, had nothing to do with no, it no yeah exactly <laughs> no and they're a great family i love epi i love their mom everyone and their family and their older sister's stud, by the way, too, played volleyball at Purdue. And I played volleyball in high school also, so she would come back to practices sometimes. Dang. And it was like, you were like bowing down to <laughs> her. She, but yeah, I'm from Edwardsville. Um, I have two siblings, older sister, and she just had a baby two days ago. So she just wow. officially made me congrats. an aunt. So congrats, Ken. Love you. And then I have an older brother as well and always played sports with him growing up. And then... My mom is the sweetest lady ever. <laughs> I'm glad you've met her before. <laughs> they just recently moved back to the Quad Cities where most of my family's from. And so it's been really nice having them closer to Iowa City. I go over there for dinner sometimes, and now they'll be able to make every home game and some away games too. So, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. I played basketball my whole life, played football, tackle football when I was little. Hey, but, yeah. okay. What position? I was quarterback. So, yeah. And I played I was the end and I was our punter and kicker. Ah, so you were do it all. <laughs> I had to do it. So all. it's no doubt you went D1 in a, in a sport, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. You're doing it all. I was just, I don't know, just grew up with like an athletic family. My dad played football in college. My mom played sports all throughout. Her sisters played basketball. One of her sisters played basketball in college. Her brother played basketball in college. Um, my dad, yeah. My dad <laughs> played football. His twin played football. My uncle. His on, twin. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Hold on. So your yeah. dad and his twin both play college football? Yep. At the same school. And then his Jeez. older brother played basketball in college. And my aunts played basketball growing up on that side, too. So I have a really big family, just like sports oriented, like through and through. I just grew up with like a football or basketball or something in my hand. So, um, and it's just like, that's how like our families like get along. Like that's what we bond over. So it's been really fun having family in the quad cities to be able to come and watch all our games. And my little cousins love it. My aunts and uncles love it. And I had probably like 30 people in Dallas too, like aunts <laughs> and uncles and friends and family. So 
it's just been it's been really fun. But yeah, sports sports kind of rule my world, <laughs> and that's a little bit about me, I guess. I'm so hold on, shook. hold that on. Is entire thing. So I know that it's like a thing, like Thanksgiving. You know, you go out and play like family football. Yeah. Did y'all do that with so many like? sports oriented people like me and my cousins and my siblings we would go play basketball and we would be up on each other sometimes <laughs> tears sometimes blood i mean that's just sport yeah you that's just exactly it, yeah. and so but there was never like a set like football game or anything you, like you. that like i know some families do that but we never did but yeah that is incredible yeah, yeah. talk about a family tree yeah wow yeah okay so recruitment process mm -hmm. how did you get to iowa what got you here yeah, so like I mentioned, I have a lot of family from Iowa, and so I grew up a Hawkeye fan. So my mom's sister is married to Coach Jay, Jan Jensen, and she's obviously the coach, <laughs> right. one of the coaches, associate <laughs> head coach. And so I grew up around the Iowa women's basketball team when I was little, and I just idolized all the players. I was going to do anything in my, you know, anything I ever could to – get to Iowa to play basketball here. And so I just fell in love with the team. I fell in love with basketball from a really young age and I would sleep with an Iowa women's basketball poster on my ceiling. <laughs> so like when I woke up, it was the first thing <laughs> I saw every morning. So it's kind of funny, but I just worked really hard and I played other sports too, you know, like I was, I just love to, you know, be with my friends and, um, just play honestly. And so I just, I played against guys all the time. I go to the Y every single day and play pickup, played against my brother, my dad. I never really like had like a personal trainer. I think things are so different now mm -hmm. than what it was. I just literally just went and played against guys. And I think it helped me a lot and got me stronger and better and mentally tough in a way because they did not <laughs> care that I was a girl <laughs> at all. And so I, um, Got like my first offer sophomore year. I was a late bloomer and then they started trickling after that. Who was the first one? Bradley University. Okay. Yeah, okay. In Illinois. And then um, Iowa offered me my junior year and I just, when Coach Bluter told me, I just started crying <laughs> right away. And my dad would always tell these other coaches on visits or home visits like, hey, like, we really like you guys, but if Iowa comes into the mix, like, good luck. <laughs> Just wanted to keep them prepared for that. Um, but I knew I came on a visit and I was just like, this is just where I want to be. This is, I couldn't go anywhere else. I didn't want to put on a different uniform. I just wanted to, you know, be a Hawkeye. And so that's kind of where it went. And I committed my junior year and then. Did you commit on the phone call? I did not. I came on a visit. I I was like, Dad, I'm going to come in. He's like, Kate, just relax. Take your time. He was pretty good because, you know, he played and sure. he's, you know, had helped me a lot in that process. And so um, I waited a little bit, took a visit. And then on my way home from the visit, I called him. Hey, <laughs> I'm, I'm coming. So, so it was quick. Yeah, it was quick. Uh, who hosted you? Or do you do, yeah. is, are they different in basketball than? Yeah, no. Um it was freshman. She ended up transferring, actually. But um, I remember, like, everybody who was on the team, like, Kathleen was still a freshman. Then oh, was wow. Junior, yeah, Doyle. So Megan was here, Tanaya, uh, Chase Coley, Hannah Stewart. So, like, McKenzie the Meyer. team of all. Yeah, <laughs> literally, yeah, literally. So I had a great time at the football game um, with them and – I was like, man, I just, I want to, I want to go here. And we actually played wiffle ball on my unofficial visit. And I, because <laughs> I, 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 they know I just love sports. And sure. I was like, this is going to be so fun. We played in Carver and I just remember that. And I was like, oh yeah, they were super competitive too. And Did you hit a ding any dingers or I anything? I did hit a home of run, course. I'm not going to lie. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I was like, yeah, this they're fun. And I love the coaches. So I just knew I wanted to to go there. And it was a reasonable distance from home. I wanted my parents to be able to come and, you know, see me come to games four hours from the St. Louis area. So, um, it was just kind of a no brainer for me. So I want to go back to something really quickly, because mm -hmm. I know we have a lot of parents that listen. We've like mm -hmm. an interesting demographic, but you, you touched very shortly on like, I didn't have a personal trainer, just did a lot mm -hmm. of different sports, that kind of thing. Like seeing how youth sports and things have evolved. And there are so many young girls who are mm -hmm. like aspiring to be exactly yeah. where you are right now. I don't know, what would be like, I don't want to say your biggest advice, but just looking at the landscape and how everything is now, how would you compare kind of your experience and maybe mm -hmm. what was so great about that as you were growing up? Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, okay. for sure. I just, I think that like nowadays, like with social media, people just think that you just, 
get there because like it just happens but it just it you have to like put in a lot of work a lot of time a lot of effort like my advice is honestly go to the Y and just play against guys play against other people play against older people um find like a good AAU program that you want to be a part of it doesn't always have to be the best team I never played for an EYBL team um, what but, does UIBL mean? Yeah, it's like elite youth basketball league. So okay. it's, it's, I don't know like any of that. No, well. yeah, they're like sponsored. Um, most of these teams are like sponsored by like Nike or Adidas or so like wow. uh, yeah, and they get they play in like these different like national tournaments, and I'm assuming it's probably very very expensive. To, uh, sure. Um, but yeah, so like if you were on an EYBL team, it's like whoa, like your team is so good but like my team wasn't and we would go and play those teams and we'd beat them and you know it just felt so great and it was it was fun but I would just say like back to your point is like go go do ball handling in the driveway you know go play outside and like play against your friends play against older people play against people who are bigger faster stronger than you like that's the only way you're gonna get better really and um just don't like don't be afraid to like you see somebody at the park or at the Y be like, Hey, like, can I join? Like, don't be afraid to do that. And just, just have fun with it too. I think a lot of joy can be taken out of it whenever it becomes like so serious, so young. Um, but I, I've never lost the joy for it and I've been playing for so long. And like, whenever you can go and play pickup, like that's so fun. So it's like, you don't, it doesn't have to be a job so young, like really enjoy it, have fun with your friends. Um, go shoot with one of your friends. Like it might be like embarrassing whenever you're young, like, Hey, do you want to go to the Y and shoot with me? But like, do it. Like it's good bonding time. It's, it's fun. And so I don't know, that, that would be my main advice. Well, That's so refreshing. Yes. Honestly. And I think there's something to it, you know, kind of going off Laura's point as well is like, there's a very quick trigger to like, uh, specialize in one sport. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot more value if you go out and play multiple sports. Cause mm -hmm. obviously you're, I don't even want to give a number on how many sports you probably played, but like, do you think that helped you as opposed to just worrying about basketball mm -hmm. the whole time? A hundred percent. Like, first of all, whenever you play multiple sports, you're going to work on different muscle groups. Like that's just like science, you know, like you're going to get stronger in different areas. So like I played volleyball and basketball in high school and like that worked on my jumping, like my quick, like reaction skills and volleyball. And that helps with basketball. And then like, it didn't, like, I didn't get burned out of basketball mm. because like I got to play another sport. And that, so that was like really refreshing. And whenever you focus on one sport all year round, it's like, oh, like sometimes you like never get a break. And like, especially when you're younger. Yeah, exactly. And so I think it's so important. Like you meet new people, you make different friends. Um, it's just like it's it helps you become a better athlete like I know like my dad from things my dad have told me like his best athletes play multiple sports you know like it's not just football like go do basketball go do baseball or whatever like it's gonna make you a better athlete all around well we had Jay Higgins on uh, a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and he actually met a lot of guys that now play football off of AAU basketball teams. I, I actually was just watching a college football game the other day and some guy didn't even play football until a senior year of high school was a <laughs> basketball guy. And now he was like playing for like a D one school <laughs> doing great. I was like, man, that's awesome. Well, we had a men's basketball player like that. I don't know how many years ago, but he played a uh, basketball. Uh, uh, Ahmad Wagner yeah. played four years here yeah. and then went and played and receiver then, at Kentucky. Yeah, I was like, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you got to be an athlete. To I've always it. thought about that, though, with basketball players. I'm like, you guys are so big. You're so strong. You're so fast. Like, can we just put you on the outside? On the football <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I think you might be okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so Lisa Bluter, we have mm -hmm. to talk about yeah. her. She is just absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. I know that you always wanted to play at Iowa, but was a big part of that because of Lisa Bluter? A hundred percent. I have pictures of me and like my, my backwards Iowa hat with Coach Bluter <laughs> and I, we're just smiling. So I've always looked up to her, um, just like what she's built here at Iowa, the culture she's created. She's not one to scream, yell in your face and degrade. She's very positive, uplifting coach. Like when she needs to get on us, yes, she will. But she's so motivating. And what I love about her more than anything is how she just really empowers us to be strong female leaders. Like she, she cares more about us as people than basketball players. And a lot of coaches preach that they preach that in the recruiting process, but coach Bluter actually, you know, she walks the walk. She doesn't just talk the talk. And, um, I, you know, 
I feel like I could go in and tell her anything or, you know, come to her with a problem and, you know, she's going to help me find a solution to it. And I think that's super rare. And it's also what makes her so great and so successful for so many years. And that's just part of the culture that she's created there. And it's just trickled down through great leaders who have come throughout Iowa and into what I've been able to, you know, kind of come into as a freshman and and now as a super, super senior. And so I'm just super grateful for her and um, everything that she's helped me do so far. And I know that she'll be there for me for the rest of my life as well. And it's, obviously she's creating teams that are going to national championships, yeah. but then she's also, and I've, we've had a conversation with her about this a while ago where you guys hone in a lot on what's life after basketball, mm-hmm. what's life outside of basketball look like for you? Because not everybody's going to go to the WNBA. Not everybody's mm-hmm. going to want to play overseas. Um, so you guys focus a lot on that too, right? Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, she's, al- she's about always about life lessons. Like she's always going to give a motivational speech or you know, give us something to think about after life. And she wants us to go and do like something as simple as like the Habitat for Humanity build. She's like, you guys need to learn how to use a hammer. Like (laughs) this will help you for the rest of your life. Like that's something simple, but that's just like a little example. Like she wants us to be successful for the rest of our lives. Sorry, I looked at her yeah. while you were talking because yeah. she hammered in some screws <laughs> to hang a picture. Oh, I could have used a habitat. For <laughs> she could have she used <laughs> anything. You could come out with us next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, she needs to. I'll sign her up today. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just excited to see what it looks like in Kinnick. Yeah. We talked a little bit before we got on the air of like, what's it like playing outside? And mm-hmm. you said you just beat up on your brother and dad in yeah. the driveway. <laughs> yeah. uh, but outside of that, like, I've, I mean... It's just got to be such a surreal experience mm-hmm. for, I'm looking forward to just seeing what that looks like. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, Nebraska did it with volleyball, yep. um, but I'm excited to see what black and gold looks like. Oh, yeah. I think it's going to be so cool, honestly. I mean, in, I, I don't know why we ever even like capped it. I think like it started like, well, we're, we're going to try to get like 30,000 people. It's like, we know Hawkeye fans <laughs> are going to show up and show out. I think yes. we've got over 50,000 now. So it's just pretty cool um, being able to run out of, the tunnel to that many fans like we've ran out to 15 20 thousand before but 50 plus thousand like that is gonna be kind of a shock but we're really excited for it and just super grateful that we even get to do something like this and that we have a community and a university that would support us in doing something to this magnitude we're we're really pumped and I was actually one more thing I was talking to Marcus Luttrell he's the lone survivor um and oh. he was at the game on on just on Saturday mm-hmm. let's see against Michigan State the night game and he was like hey I just heard about this crossover at Canic I'm coming back for that so I was like <laughs> massive you that know that is awesome yeah he's like that is incredible I can't wait I'm coming back he's yeah, got he his did. bibs on he's like and I'm wearing these <laughs> oh <laughs> like, yes incredible need to so get him a front row be, seat there you go there's going to be some pretty some pretty cool people there <laughs> including you guys of course and That's Hawkeye fans I know you're listening right now we've got like what 20,000 tickets left something like that let's fill those seats we got it we got to get this stadium rocking mm-hmm. and get it completely full there's still tickets available make sure you're grabbing those for crossover at Kinnick. Kate, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was me a pleasure. Guys. Yeah. Best awesome. of luck the rest thank of the you. as we start the season. And then, of course, uh, at Kinnick, can't wait to see you there. This season, Marquis Pizzeria is teaming up with Nico Regani to help the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. Together, they've created a new signature pizza, the Nico Parm. Sounds so good. $2 of every pizza will be donated to the Children's Hospital. Visit Marquis Pizzeria located in the Coralville River Landing this fall and help the kids by eating pizza. The Bugman Pest Control. Rest easy when you have the Bugman's top-rated defense protecting your home and business, providing maintenance and prevention treatments for any problem. Call today for a free quote, 563-554-BUGS. Proudly serving the Hawkeye State since 2008. Locally owned and operated, Performance is a full-service restoration company serving Eastern Iowa. As an IICRC certified firm, their multi-licensed technicians have decades of experience in water, mold, and fire mitigation. Whether it's your home or business, this is the team you want in a time of need. Performance Restoration, 319-626-2292. The Appliance Barn offers a wide range of high-quality appliances at unbeatable prices. Whether you're in the market for a new refrigerator, dishwasher, or washing machine, they've got you covered. They also have a delivery and setup department to ensure your appliances get delivered and installed quickly. To find out more, visit appliancebarn.com. Alrighty, welcome back. Matt, how cool is Kate Martin? Just saying. The, f- the family lineage is wild. <laughs> Not even just immediate family, but like 
immediate family's extended family. Like it's yeah. No, when we were done with greatness. that, yeah, when we were done with that, I was like, Matt, that is this is what we're going for. <laughs> like <laughs> the family tree, incredible. Yeah, and she's just so cool. Like just the epitome of Elisa Bluter, coached athlete. Yes, I love yes. it so much. Understanding like how to go about their business, but also enough to have fun with it. Yeah, and I feel like that's there's a definite nuance there for sure. Okay, let's hop back into football. I love the crossover, by the way. That was super fun. Wisconsin this week. This is this is a pretty big game just mm-hmm. because it goes back and forth so much. Um, and we've been playing them since 1894. Isn't that crazy? Wow. It's like a really long time ago. Um, and we've been playing for the Heartland Trophy only since 2004. Okay. That doesn't seem like... I feel like it's been there for a lot longer than the that. Same. Same. That's... Tw- well, 19 years, I guess. Almost 20 years. I'm not going to check your mouth on that. I'm just going to trust you. Thanks. <laughs> but I want to talk about the bull for just a second. So I found this really funny story. And it's it's just funny. We're just going to hop into it. So um, like I said, it was unveiled. It was unveiled in 2004. And the designer of it was a former Iowa player, Frank Strub. And um, what I found on here was just interesting okay. to say the least okay. okay so bob bowlsby was the iowa athletic director at the time and frank brought the bowl that he had designed to him and bowlsby was like yeah i don't know about this so i'm just going to read you the conversation <laughs> what do you mean don't know so about funny. this <laughs> so jones the guy um that like helped strub frank strub his okay. last name is jones they don't have his first name on here you probably find it somewhere. Anyway, he was the guy that helped Strub like create this okay. this bowl, and so they're just like recounting this, recounting this, and um, he goes, "It had some balls on it at first, Chuckled Jones, Strub's co collaborator on the Big Ten traveling trophy and president of Russell's Trophies and Engraving in Urbandale, Iowa, a western suburb of Des Moines. Okay, cool. There you go. That's who Jones is. I just don't know what his first name is. And then when we took it over and he showed Bullsby. <laughs> I think it was Bullsby who said, yeah, we can't have these balls hanging down there. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, no problem, said Strub. I got this. <laughs> and Jones said, I'll never forget when Frank took that little ex- uh, X-Acto knife and just shoop, and they dropped off. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's like, we laughed about that for, for a long time. But how funny is that? It's, so a, it's-, it's a stat. Uh, where's <laughs> that from, by the way, that article? It's from SB Nation. Okay. It's very funny. You'll have to go through and read it. it. It talks about all of the the history of the bowl. And um, I think they had Barry Alvarez was talking about how the reason that they created it back in 04 was um, just to kind of like signify that Iowa and Wisconsin, like the way that they play each other is just a um, kind of like a, a, a really good example of what the heartland is hmm. um, to like rough and tumble. Hard nose. Hard nose. Um, just two teams that. Big time football. Yeah. Like essentially. That always just have a, a good battle and and yeah, from the heartland, of course. So mm. that's what it represents. Very and cool. um it used to look a little different. <laughs> <laughs> but we talked about this too in our um recap of Purdue, but Deacon Hill going back to where he transferred from, going back to Wisconsin. And I feel like a lot of times we talk about when you're going into an opposing environment, like as a quarterback, it takes a lot for you to stay composed. And I think this is gonna be a test for him just in terms of like mentally you're going back to the place that you transferred out of, but also a test of like the environment in Wisconsin. It's a very good game day environment. Mm -hmm. It is so much fun. So when I was in college, I actually went um, to Wisconsin and sat in the student section, with a couple of friends, and it was really interesting. And they weren't playing Iowa, by the way, we were playing somebody else. And um, they have so many game day traditions. Obviously we all know of jump around. Um, and I just want to talk about that for a second. So that started in 1998. So there was a marketing intern and happened to be a tight end on the team, um, that was injured. And so him and his friend before the game were like, let's come up with a playlist, um, that's going to get like the team pumped up, get the fans pumped up. And they put jump around on there. And in 1998, they're playing Purdue with Drew Brees leading the team, leading the offense. And they were like going down the field. They were headed toward the student section and it was like a really good series for Purdue. And they're like, we got to get get something to like rattle them, get the student section going crazy because obviously they're right in front of them. So they played jump around. The student section goes crazy, stands up. They all start jumping. And so that's when it started. 
Then in 2003, the stadium went through some renovations and the administration was like, um, for this opening home game, like, I really don't think we should play jump around because we're worried about the structure <laughs> of the stadium. And if they get going, like some things could come loose and That's this incredible. could be like a safety hazard. So they didn't play it for that opening game. And the student section, like everybody in the entire stadium starts booing because they play, I believe, between the third and fourth quarter. Yep. And the student section starts booing. They're like turning their backs to the field. Like we're not even going to watch anymore. Like they were bad. So then the next game, they, they brought it back and everybody was super <laughs> happy. But isn't that crazy? <laughs> Worried about the structural integrity of the stadium. Camp Randall, take it easy. Um, but they also have some other interesting, you know, one of them is very interesting, uh, different traditions. So... If you've ever been to Wisconsin, I mean, not you, but if you've ever been to Wisconsin, obviously you have um, the the announcer, the PA announcer always says, and that's another, do you know this? Well, I'm not going to say it. First in 10, Wisconsin. And the entire place says it. And to be honest with you, it gets super old if you're not a Wisconsin fan. It's kind of like the Northwestern, like, <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Oh, wait, that was so good. And yeah, it is kind of <laughs> like that. First in 10, Wisconsin. And the game that I went to was when Melvin Gordon was still on the team. And it was that snowy game. I can't remember who they were playing. They're playing Nebraska. And he had like the game of his life. The amount of times that I heard first and 10 Wisconsin. I was like, okay, guys, we get it. <laughs> He's got a lot of first downs. Um, but there's that one, Build Me Up Buttercup. Everybody sings it and like sways their arms. Build me up, buttercup, baby. Don't you let me know. You know that? Uh, now I do. That's <laughs> around, worst of all. Anyway, so that's another one. They have some other ones just in the student section, like the keys one, which I know a lot of um, teams do, like take your shoe off and do that. Yeah. I'm not taking my shoe off. It's freezing. I'm not doing that. A lot of people love it. And they have a ton of other ones too. This one was very shocking if you're going there for your first time. So the sections of the student section are P, like there's a P section and O section. Like that's the, the names of the section. And they yell back and forth at each other. And I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, like edit this myself. I'm not going to put that on our producers, but they say, one says eat poop, <laughs> you know, the other yeah, word. Yeah. <laughs> and the other side says, um, screw you, F you, back to them. And they, it, it's the most random thing. There's no reason for it. There's no history behind it. It's just like, they just do it. That's my understanding. <laughs> and I guess a lot of the like older fans and like obviously people that have kids there, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's just one of those things that like makes no sense that 18 and 19 year olds came up with some time ago and they just eat poop, screw you, eat poop over and over. Well, if somebody out there can give us a little bit more history on that, I'd be very intrigued. Isn't that so weird? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It just doesn't uh, feel like something I'd want to um, participate in. But anyway, that's that's one of the other ones. Um, but yeah. The other thing about Wisconsin is their student section is so weird mm -hmm. in that they don't show up when the game starts. Yeah. So if you're watching on TV, you'll you'll notice like the student section, first quarter, there's really not that many people there. They start to trickle in. And the way that they do the student section too is as you walk in, it's not just a free for all. Like they kind of siphon you down and tell you where to sit, which was really annoying. It's like, let me just pick my spot. Like hmm. it's, it's an open student section. You don't have to, you know, anyway. So... Yeah, Wisconsin student section. They will show up late, but they will be there for jump around. And I'm going to be honest, like if they're losing, they'll leave right after jump around. <laughs> it's so weird, but huh. something you wouldn't find at, at an Iowa student section. Because no, they fly to the spot. They fly to Hawks their spots. Fly. Yeah, and it is, it is a free for all for sure. They just, shoo, they just go and they stay and they're loud. They actually played a video. I'm getting off on a tangent here, but they actually played a video at the game on Saturday where at Big Ten Media Days, they asked some of the players and coaches, like, what's what's the best student section? What are the, you know, the hardest places to play? And a lot of people said, a lot of the players, and um, I believe it was Coach Franklin from Penn State, um, they're like, Iowa, definitely Iowa. Like, they're loud, they're crazy. Um, they're right on top of you. They're that's right, one of my that's favorite part about Kinnick. That's exactly what Coach Franklin said. He's like, they are right there, like on top of you, which I never really understood. But then you watch like Michigan, like at Michigan at the so big house. So far away. They're so far away. Iowa State, so far away. But yeah, something special about Kinnick Stadium, I guess. Well, uh, actually, coming back to that. So Melvin Gordon, mm -hmm. I'm like 90% sure he was committed to Iowa before he was committed to Wisconsin. He decommitted from Iowa to go to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anytime they came down, so I played in 2014 when Wisconsin came down against Melvin Gordon. It was a close game. Um, he wore, uh, 
uh, earplugs because oh, the fans yeah. were yelling so much at him mm -hmm. that he wore earplugs because he couldn't take it. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> <Go Hawks. laughs> uh, okay let's hop into like the football of wisconsin though um the atmosphere is going to be crazy it'll be interesting to see deacon kind of go back um to that and how he handles that mentally because i would assume that would be kind of tough but for sure um do you want to talk offense or defense well let's talk about the fact we'll, we'll we'll start with wisconsin's offense but this is not the wisconsin that barry alvarez coached mm -hmm. when they began the bowl now it's a trophy game obviously very cool uh, a lot of Big Ten West implications based on this game. Like, I mean, every other game, every game is a big game, right? This one just has a few more implications that, you know, like Iowa State doesn't have because it's not a Big Ten opponent. But playing for the Bull obviously means something. But Wisconsin's only loss is against uh, Washington State, which, again, as of right now, is not a conference opponent. Will be. Um, but as of right now, is not a conference opponent. So, um like this has a lot of implications for who can go to Indianapolis at the end of the year, but this is not the same Wisconsin team. And what I mean by that is Luke Fickle's the head coach. He uh, most recently was at the university of Cincinnati and they sling it now. Like they average 30 passes a game. Wow. They pass it almost as much as they run it. Hmm. Now they've got a really good running back in Braylon Allen and Ches Malusi is also really good. They kind of split time. Um, keep those guys fresh. Most, teams including Iowa is kind of a running back by committee just to make sure that those guys stay fresh they get hit a lot so they try to help those guys out um but I'm talking like shotgun three wide receivers on the field like they still have their power stuff they or maybe I should say they can do their power stuff but it's mostly shotgun and spread out so I mean it's gonna be more of like the Big Ten's version of the air raid <laughs> I mean it's still Big Ten football but they're just more willing to sling it which is a very contrast of styles from what you're used to seeing of like run, 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 play action, run, 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 play action, right? And the game's done in like 45 minutes because the clock was running the entire game. You know? Okay, question for you with that. So there's two things that come to my head with that is that there's um, an opportunity for our defense where we've got a lot of guys that can make plays and make some turnovers. With the ball in the air. Right. Mm -hmm. But then the other side of me says, the other part of me says, um, We've seen with like Purdue in the past. Who's that really good receiver that Purdue had? David Bell. David Bell. I wanted to say Bell, but I couldn't think of his first name. Like where they would boop, boop, boop down the field. And like boop, boop, I mean a uh, five-yard pass, 10-yard pass. You know what I mean? And, and like then all of a that, sudden, 80-yard pass. And, yes. Yeah. And that has kind of like, that's kind of been our number a little bit in the past with our defense. Am I right on that or am I a little off mark? We're a little bit more of a bend, don't break defense, meaning okay. you limit the big plays and you force the other team to have the patience to throw hitches. Okay. Because most teams don't have the patience to throw nine hitches in a row. Mm -hmm. You know, and then our guys can come up. But with guys like Cooper, they try to run a double move against him against Michigan State. Like he's there yeah. knowing that the small pass is there, but again, limit the big plays. So could we see a boop, boop, boop? For sure. But uh, they do a lot of crossers. They do a lot of things like that. So I would anticipate that one of our ball hawking guys are going to be in the way. It's just so frustrating as a fan to watch that, the boop, boop, boop plays, because you're like, ah, oh, there's eight yards again. Oh, there's three yards again. Oh, there's five. You know what I mean? But that's really how we play. Well, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just saying like. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and that's why I'm explaining it, because yes. I think that's. You know, it's like, oh, how did we give up eight yards? Like, right. Well, yeah, because we're not giving up the 42-yard touchdown. Mm -hmm. Like, we we think that the longer our defense is out there now, not like Penn State long where it's 90-some plays, mm -hmm. but if our defense continues to get opportunities to make plays, we trust that our defense is eventually going to make one. Yep. And it's 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 almost like, it's almost like ping pong in a way. Yeah, hmm. wait on this. <laughs> It's almost like ping pong. So I used to play ping pong with CJ Beathard quite a bit, and he whooped me every single time. But he was really good because he was a defensive ping pong player. And what I mean by that was he wasn't like doing the fast overhand top spin, whatever, and trying to be aggressive. It was more so like the backhand, like, I'm just going to keep hitting it back to you. And eventually you're going to get annoyed of this and you're going to hit it out and then I'm going to get the point. So same thing with this. I was defense is going to force you to make a mistake because you're trying to do too much because you don't like doing the little dink stuff, and then eventually we'll make a play. That was a really good analogy. Thanks. Really first full circle. Well done. <laughs> that was probably an oval. I tried really hard to make a circle. <laughs> Wait, that, and now- I gotta do the- And you're watching Disney Channel. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, that was pretty good. <laughs> okay. Anything else about the offense? Third down percentage is pretty good. 
Yeah, there. Uh, so when I was there under Coach Davis, it was very clear like where our uh, percentages, where we wanted to be, and like basically we'd mark whether or not we hit it. Mm -hmm. So each game we wanted to be at about forty eight percent on third down because sometimes you get in a situation where you get a holding penalty and it's like third and twenty two, and it's like you're gonna do what you can, but that you don't expect to make that as often as you do like a third and three, yeah. right? So usually right around fifty percent and. They're there. I think they're at 47. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? So like they're pretty good about staying on the field and they've got um, obviously the two running backs. So if they get into third and short, they feel confident with those two guys. They sling it a decent amount, but their quarterback also has carried the ball. I think he's their third leading rusher in terms of carries. So he's got the ability to scoot, which I mean, that's something that we got to keep in the pocket now that we've had the ability. Maybe I shouldn't say the ability now that we've had the success of being able to rush the passer. Because you could argue that Hudson Card, even though he did like those weird throwing things uh, when he got out of, out of the pocket, we did a good job of maintaining his athletic ability within the pocket, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's going to have to be similar to that against them, which is not something we're used to having to do against Wisconsin. How is their offensive line? Do you know? Uh, normally, Wisconsin breeds those dudes that are like 6'9", 410 <laughs> pounds. Like it's... Is that real? No. Okay. No. It's <laughs> probably pretty close though. I mean, their 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 front five are usually massive humans, just farm boys that come out and just have that kind of strength, mm -hmm. similar to Iowa. I just thought our D line looked really good this past weekend. And Agreed. So hopefully they can carry that into this weekend too. Absolutely. Let's talk about our offense. Let's talk about our third down percentage, which is just slightly different from Wisconsin's. Yeah. So we're at about twenty seven percent, which clearly that number needs to rise. Sure. I think it, it, you mentioned it at the beginning. How does Deacon handle this? What, what's the what's the consistent um, coaching and support from the players? You know, his his receivers, his tight ends, but also Cade. Cade's played in a lot of very big environments at the University of Michigan. So how do how can he help relay what to expect from Deacon? Now, Wisconsin, like you said, I mean, the environment itself is crazy. This is going to be his first away game that he's going to play. Mm. That's new. And it's homecoming for him, meaning Deacon. I don't know if this is Wisconsin's homecoming. I really don't care. But like Deacon leaving this program to come to Iowa now has the opportunity to go win a trophy at that stadium. I mean. Do you think that that's a, a talking point in the locker room where it's like, oh, this guy left us because he didn't think da 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 da? Oh, I'm sure. It is. Like, I'm sure. What do they call it? Whiteboard material or something? Bulletin board material. Bulletin board. <laughs> Same thing. Because <laughs> I mean, you can erase a whiteboard. True. I mean, bulletin board, you just pull the tack out, but. It is what it is. Okay. Good um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, they probably have a little bit of that depending upon if he was a, a jerk while he was there or if he was nice. I'm sure not. I he mean, like based on, nice based guy. on our limited, uh, well, your limited communication with him, seems like he's a super nice kid, but there's going to be some of that of like, oh, he left us and now we're going to show him why he shouldn't have kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, in, inevitably there's going to be something behind, you know, there. Sure. Similar to the way I'm sure our guys viewed Tyrone Tracy coming back and playing at Iowa, right? I mean, I know they're all boys, but at the token, like, hey, now you're playing us, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think Wisconsin's going to have something similar um, for Deacon Hill. But how do, how, do they, how do they ease him into the game? I think that's the biggest thing. We start off with some deep balls and stuff like that. But I think the easiest way into a game is like a quick slant, quick out, let him complete two easy passes. So he knows he can do it mm -hmm. because, um, the biggest thing is you come out there and you throw a bunch of incompletions. It starts to wear on your mind a little bit and be like, man, what's going on with me? Like whatever you can have all the support in the world, but really it comes down to what kind of confidence you have within yourself. And if you prove, Oh yeah, I can make that throw. I can make that throw easy. You know, pregame warmups are one thing, but once there's like bullets flying, as they say, or you're in live action where you can actually get hit, if you can make a quick dump off or a quick screen, like we saw Eric All score against Michigan State, you do one of those and be like, okay, yeah, I'm in the rhythm of the game. I'm good. And I think that's how you'll get that kind of emotion back down to here to where he can compete at a high level. Interesting. I feel like that is um, that's just some good life lessons too, Matt. Thank you so much for that. Uh -oh. Full of them. Full of something. <laughs> I, full of something. That is correct. Love and affection. <laughs> okay. Anything else that you want to say? How about their um, their defense? What kind of defense do they play? We haven't touched on that at all. Yeah. Uh, they played Rutgers a lot of man-to-man. -man. Um, what's interesting is you'll see something different once we get into the red zone and really the low red, as they say. Do you know the difference between the high red and the low red in the red zone? I would assume low red would just be closer to the end zone. Laura. Golf club, everybody. 
Yeah. So it's like inside the 10, essentially. And they play what we call a fence defense. Now, watching their game against Rutgers, Rutgers actually had an opportunity to go down 10-7 right before the half. They drove all the way down. Now, their quarter, they went, they played a lot of man-to-man and their quarterback can scoot. So, you know, they would get caught on crossers. He was able to hit some guys. But then if he didn't see anybody open, there's nobody responsible for him, which sometimes um, they have what's called a spy. You know what a spy is? We've talked about this before, but... Okay. No. That doesn't mean I was listening to you. I just said you've talked about it before. <laughs> a spy is when it's Is like it a the, linebacker that comes up? Can be. Did you say that at one point? Maybe. <laughs> Not on this particular podcast. It would have been in the closet podcast. <laughs> Um, I should, I should rephrase that. That was our first podcast I was done in the closet. Um, <laughs> it still sounds weird, but <laughs> either way, um, but either way, um, so a spy is essentially, normally it's a defensive lineman or a linebacker okay. that literally just watches the quarterback. And you typically do that on a more athletic quarterback because if he goes like our, our defensive line has like their, uh, their lanes that they're supposed to rush in to keep him in the pocket. But sometimes you get pushed out like those are scholarship athletes on the other side too. So if they push us out of the lane, quarterback might have an opportunity to run at that time. That's where the spy is like, I got you. It's basically man to man on the quarterback. So everybody else is man to man to receivers. He's basically man to man on the quarterback. So when he scrambles, I go. Got it. Um, and so, uh, they didn't do that against the Rutgers kid. Rutgers kid got him all the way down inside the seven yard line. I'm pretty sure. Right before half, there's 20 seconds to go, and they played, Wisconsin did, what's called fence defense, where essentially they just take their four defensive linemen, put them up, or, uh, yeah, I think they had four on this particular play, and then like a linebacker or two, and then they had everybody else stand on the goal line, like feet are on the goal line, and it's just a zone. If they run into my zone, I've got them, but I'm not moving from this spot because I'm, I've put up a fence or a wall at uh, the goal line. So they call it fence defense. And on this particular one, they ran like a crossing route. Well, the problem is when you do crossers, and it, they were both on the boundary, one ran a quick slant, the other one ran it out. Um, when you do that, they they pass it off. They banjo it, essentially. Yep, here we go. So we call it banjo, <laughs> or you can call it in and out. I think we call it in and out in high school, where the guy on the inside, no matter what happens, he takes the guy on the inside. And the outside, no matter what happens, takes the guy on the outside. So it's man-to-man, but you're more matching after the play starts where does the banjo come in i actually don't know the origin of that name but <laughs> okay. like i've heard it referred to as banjo i've heard it referred to as in and out i was just waiting for it to come around and it just never unfortunately i don't have that one it didn't come no full that's circle. that's more just breeding rainbow it doesn't go all the way around <laughs> to the circle okay um but essentially um the guy on the outside is waiting for the outbreaking route and so the guy ran it out and he jumps it goes 95 yard pick six his time basically expires in the first half so instead of going down 10 7 into half they're down 17 nothing going into half. Mm-hmm. So Wisconsin was opportunistic in that area. Their fence defense worked great. Um, but Rutgers had an opportunity, I thought, to make that game closer than – the final score was 24-13. to 13. It wasn't a big discrepancy. Um, Rutgers playing pretty good football. But, um, you know, that kind of defense, we just got to be aware of. We got to know who's picking us up, and ball placement is going to be key. And um, 13 sacks their defense has on the year. Yeah, we finally got some. Uh, so we went from three on the year – now we're at nine on the year <laughs> after okay. six against uh, Purdue. I think I mentioned I, uh, in the recap, I couldn't remember exactly what it was. I looked it up before we filmed the preview. So, um, but yeah, now it's, so now we're up to nine. So that's kind of a wash. They're plus four in the turnover margin. We're zero. So that's going to be a uh, key point of emphasis always is take care of the football, right? That's Hawkeye football. Mm-hmm. It's play tough defense, play special teams, run the football, and take care of the ball. I mean, that's usually how Iowa wins it. But, um, you know, it's been ugly. You could argue that commentators are saying it's ugly. And I've actually seen this video go around. Uh, it's from a show that you watched. Breaking Bad. Uh, Breaking Bad, yeah. Yep. Where it's like, he can't keep getting away with it. <laughs> because <laughs> we keep uh, winning. It, because you keep winning, playing great defense, great special teams, and taking care of the ball as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So um, it's kind of interesting to see the... the um, the difference of we need all these things and yet we're still sitting at five and one, Mm -hmm. which what that tells me is that if we're sitting at five and one and there's room to improve, think of how good you can be. Mm -hmm. We can't harp on what's happened. It's done. You know, regardless of what we rank on third down or rank on offense or ranked on whatever, if you're winning ball games, I'd much rather win. I'd much rather learn from a win than learn from a loss. We talked about that before. 
But if if you're in this particular spot and the only place to go is up, think of how good your team can be if you continue to improve and strive towards that. And if you're going up against the ones every day on defense, we're hoping that that growth uh, happens sooner rather than later, of course. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot on this game in terms of every game is big, but a lot on this game in terms of what implications can be for the West, trophy game, away environment, Deacon going back home. Like there's a lot of different storylines and narratives that can be taken away from this. Um, but I'm excited to see how we respond. Yeah. The game of football and college football especially is like one of the best entertainment pieces in the world, in my opinion, just because like you said, there are so many different storylines. I was just talking to someone yesterday and they're like, oh, what do you think of Deacon? How's he going to do? I'm like, I don't know. I just know that it's another plot twist in the story of what this season looks like. It's an unfortunate plot twist because it's not exactly how we thought it was going to plan out. And like the excitement of having that, um, you know, Cade transferring in and all of the things, right? Luke Lachey going down. Jazz still isn't back. Like all of these things that are like, this is not how we thought this was going to pan out. But it just adds to the storyline, like I said, of, of this season and what that looks like. And it's just the it's the it's a great story. It's it's so much fun to watch. It's it's entertaining. It's um, it's excitement. It's all of the things. And so seeing Deacon get this opportunity on unfortunate circumstances, as he's alluded to in his press mm -hmm. conferences and things too, it's it's like it's his time. So now we we take this plot twist and we go forward. Next man in. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, I don't know what the weather's going to be like in Wisconsin on Saturday, Matt. I haven't even looked it up. You're so mad about on. <laughs> I don't have to go. Previous outfit. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I don't have to be there, so I I don't know. I'll probably be wearing pajamas on Saturday and watching the game. You're gonna run around with Dax. It gets mm -hmm. pretty toasty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, should be a good game. Trophy on the line. We've got one in Iowa City. Got to keep the uh, the bull here, minus the balls. <laughs> Things I never thought I'd be saying. <laughs> <laughs> Things I didn't think you'd ever be saying. <laughs> okay, Matt, this has been a great podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for those of you that are watching or listening, please make sure you like, subscribe, leave a comment. Uh, we love being able to read the comments and I'm good at taking constructive criticism. So if there's anything that we can do better, uh, let me know and then I'll figure out how to phrase it to her. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we love you guys' support. We put out reels on our Instagram. Uh, it's Talking Hawks Pod, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure, right? So we'll put out different uh, different reels. Our production team does a phenomenal job on that kind of stuff and they're getting pretty creative back there. I'm a little <laughs> nervous about what they're going to come up with on this podcast. Uh, but just make sure that you're paying attention to that. Share it if you want uh, other people to listen. Otherwise, we're excited to have you here. Yes, appreciate your support always, and go Hawks! Go Hawks!